Welcome to the Australian Naval History podcast series for the first of two episodes on Australian Navy code breaking during the Second World War. It is a production of the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, in partnership with the Australian Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, the Submarine Institute of Australia, and the Sea Power Centre Australia. I'm Commander Alastair Cooper. In both world wars, the Royal Australian Navy made a significant contribution to the Allied war effort through its work in breaking enemy coded signals and analysing their signal traffic. Shrouded in secrecy during the war and afterwards, the Australian Navy's code breaking efforts made a significant contribution to Allied victory. It was a dynamic and highly prized activity, even though its largest organisation, the Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne, or FRUMAL as it was called for short, is little known today. To shine a light on this fascinating story, I am joined via Skype by Dr Ian Fennigworth, a former naval officer and communications specialist who has written a number of books on Australian naval history, including the biography of the codebreaker, Captain Eric Nave. And here with me in the studio, Dr Joe Streisick, whose PhD dissertation was the RAN's cryptographic work. Mr Craig Colley, author of Codebreakers, Inside the Shadow World of Signals Intelligence in Australia's Two Bletchley Parks. Bletchley Park being the name of Britain's famous code-breaking centre in World War II. And Vice Admiral Peter Jones, author of Australia's Argonauts, which in part describes the lives of two of the major figures in the RAN code-breaking effort, Commander Rupert Long and Commander Jack Newman. In this first episode, we will cover the interwar period and the lead up to the creation of the Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. Craig, could I start with you? And could we just explain some of the key terms and technologies that are used in the code breaking effort? The key terms, um, crypt crypt cryptography is the, the um, practice of coding and encoding messages. Cryptology is its study. Uh, codes and ciphers are generally used synonymously. There's technical differences. Codes are substitution of a string of letters or numbers, usually numbers, mm -hmm. for letters, words or phrases. A cipher is a direct substitution of a number or a word for a number. Um, we've got encoding, which is the creation of a coded uh, message to hide its meaning. Uh, it's encoding or encrypting or enciphering. Decoding is the reverse, decrypting, deciphering. Um, and the process of decoding, which is the one that uh, the two uh, organisations in Australia were doing, uh, is in two stages. First of all, you've got to work out what the code is, what the values are, and set up a table of them. Uh, then when you have that, you apply them to the messages you've intercepted so you can convert a, a coded message to an uncoded message. The technology, the Japanese diplomatic messages were coded by a machine with a revolving uh, wheel, a bit like the, well, the famous German Enigma machine. But the military didn't use the machines, probably because they're inconvenient to carry into battle. Uh, they used code books, which was just a book saying what each word was translated to. With the main Navy code, J JN25, the Japanese used, uh, each coded value was into a five-digit number. Mm -hmm. And then there was a second, they were double encoded, and the, uh, the, the Japanese had a, an additive book which was a series of random five-digit numbers, and they were added to each number in turn, and the, addition, the sum of the addition was what was uh, transmitted. So to decode, you've got to first of all get the additives and strip them off, then you've got to fi find the code and convert the coded message to an uncoded message. They thought it was impregnable, but it wasn't. It's certainly very complicated. You bet. <laughs> Joe? The, the episode, um, in earlier episodes, uh, some of the code breaking efforts uh, that w occurred in World War I uh, were discussed. Could you just recap um, a little bit of what happened there and then the, uh, the legacy that it left for the uh, code breaking efforts in the interwar period? Yeah, um, 
Predominantly the efforts around World War I were the uh, work of uh, Professor Fred Wheatley, who was given a captured German book, code book, which was uh, um, designated HVB, and it was used to communicate between German warships and their auxiliaries. Uh, he found the key to that <coughs> and was able to decode intercepted messages. Um, that information was forwarded on to the Admiralty in London uh, and in a met signal which said, yeah, we've captured this code book and it's for communicating between warships and their, their um, auxiliaries. In England, that message was actually miswritten and it would, yeah, they left out the bit about what the use was that is for communicating between the um, merchant ships and the uh, German warships. So they just got a message saying, we've captured this code book. Um, and they, they ignored that. It was only after the Australians sent a second message uh, explaining in a bit more detail what the book was that the uh, Admiralty just said, please send copies. Um, and in the meantime, Room 40, the World War I code breaking organisation, were sending messages to Australia for Wheatley to decrypt. A second code book was also, had also been captured, and this was given to a uh, chap by the name of Ling, who was uh, sent off to join HMAS Australia mm -hmm. with the intent of decrypting on board intercepted messages and providing that, in, that uh, information direct to the Admiral. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, Australia was ordered back to help escort the ships to uh, German New Guinea, so Ling never got his um, sort of five minutes in, uh, in the sunshine in that respect. <coughs> After the war, basically all naval code breaking ceased because the Brits didn't have a, a naval enemy um, and Australia had no requirements either. Mm. But in 1921, at the Penang Naval Conference, it was decided to start to establish uh, direction finding stations in, in the Far East and the Pacific. Um, as well as that, the Australian delegation was given a copy of the Japanese telegraphic code, uh, which was the Japanese Morse code. Now, the Japanese Morse code was different from the standard Morse. Mm -hmm. um, and the instructions were that uh, Navy telegraphists were to be trained in the uh, reception of a Japanese Morse uh, whilst at sea. Um, and this training started to occur, and ships of the fleet like HMAS Albatross were used to intercept messages. Unfortunately, the fleet commander complained about this because he saw it as putting extra work on top of the uh, telegraphists. So eventually it was uh, stopped. In 1927-ish, uh, the Admiralty asked the Australians to start looking at intercepting Japanese messages out of the Japanese mandated islands, mm -hmm. which are now roughly the Carolinas and so forth. And so a scheme was hatched whereby the yacht of the administrator of uh, the mandated territory of New Guinea um, would be fitted out with uh, radio receivers, automatic recording equipment, and manned by a group of specialist telegraphists. And it would sail the waters around Rabaul intercepting um, Japanese messages. Mm -hmm. Now this, the ship went up there, but it didn't prove as effective as they thought, so they eventually landed the party. But from April to June 27, the operation continued. All the recordings, etc., were then packed up, sent to London for analysis. Uh, and they found it contained just commercial and training messages. So the, the Admiralty said, look, there's no sense you know, monitoring any of this stuff. Um, and that decision, with the, as well as the fall off in training of telegraphists, meant that by about 1930, there were only eight trained um, procedure-wide telegraphists in the RAN. Um, in 1936, the Naval Board advised the Amphi that it was going to construct three HFDF stations. Uh, the one, one originally proposed for a ball was moved to Darwin. Mm -hmm. uh, one was to have been in Sydney, and now they're on Rottnest Island. Okay. Ultimately, they were constructed in Darwin, Harmon, and in, outside of Fremantle at Jandicott. 
Okay. Uh, they also advise they'll be building an intercept station at Harmon in Canberra. Um, and so, you know, construction of these facilities started. And at the same time, a leading telegraphist, Barnes, who had been one of the leading lights of the um, Procedure Y project, as it were, he had retired from the Navy to go and work at Nauru as the wireless operator. But he transferred to the reserves. So as reserve training um, days, he would actually go over night time and monitor traffic, Japanese traffic out of the mandated islands, and then send that back to Australia. And this material was then forwarded to, um, up, was forwarded up to um, Hong Kong, where the British had established the Far East Combined Bureau. Okay. Um, now that, that, that operation ran in from 36 to 39, uh, and it stopped in 39 when the administrator of, the, uh, of Nauru, well, a new administrator was appointed, but he wasn't a naval reservist, so he couldn't be let in on the secret. Um, so by, by 1939, at the start of the European War, uh, construction had started on the DF stations, a SIGINT station. Recruitment had commenced of um, personnel to man those stations. But uh, what was missing in, uh, to some extent was um, a capability to decode messages and independently analyse them. So we're really talking about a very small um, uh, number of people, a very nascent capability, yes, if you like. It, it, yeah, it was a very small cadre. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, the, the stuff that was operational in '39 was directed more towards um, you know, focusing on German and, the, and supporting the European war. So it would be uh, listening to German transmissions, um, you know, uh, predominantly from um, the big transmitters in Germany. Okay. We, sh we should point out uh, for everybody that HFDF stands for High Frequency Direction Finding oh, yeah. because there, is th there are two related activities. One is actually locating where a transmission is coming from, um, which is useful in its own right, and then what we're talking about today, actually understanding the content of that transmission yeah. as well. Yeah. Ian Fennigworth, um, we've just heard that there are a very small number of people uh, who were involved. Um, a key figure during the period was Eric Nave. Um, you've written uh, a biography about him, engagingly titled, A Man of Intelligence. Um, Ian, who was Eric Nave? Can you tell us a bit about him and his contribution? Yes, can, can, I, can I pay tribute to my wife who invented the title, which has been magical. <laughs> my only bestseller, so there we are. Um, Eric Nave was a South Australian, born in 1899. Uh, his father was a clerk in the South Australian Railways. And uh, Eric was very good at school, particularly in subjects like history. And um, when he left school, he went to join the South Australian Railways as well as a paymaster's clerk. And uh, by this time, the war had started, of course, and everybody was uh, itching to get into the fight. And, this is World uh, War One. Uh, yeah, World War One, yeah. and uh, and uh, so Eric um, cast around for a way of doing this. He was underage, of course, and then he saw an ad in the paper for. Uh, temporary uh, work for in, in the Royal Australian Navy um, for clerks and he applied. Um, he didn't get the position and so his father, who was a very determined man, as Eric was too, said, well, this is a bit odd, spoke to their local um, senator and uh, even visited Melbourne to find out what the hell had gone wrong. And they went to the Navy office and uh, were told there that Eric's marks weren't good enough <coughs> and pointed out that he was practically top of the top of the list in South Australia, there must have been some error. Uh, and a couple of days later, they got, uh, he got, had a request to come and join the Navy as a, as a permanent officer, which he did, again, as a paymaster. So he's, he's a, what we now call a supply officer. We don't call him that anymore, actually. We call him maritime logistics. But anyway, he was a supply officer. And uh, he was posted after initial training to uh, the uh, cruiser Encounter, uh, and uh, he, he, saw, he saw sea service in the, in the Pacific. Um, but one of the requirements of those days was that young officers to be promoted 
needed to sh demonstrate uh, proficiency in a foreign language. Most people chose French or German because they're relatively easy to learn. I'm not going to say they're easy, but they're relatively easy. But Eric noticed that the regulations allowed for a much higher daily rate of pay if you chose a language like Japanese. I said he was a puffer. So <laughs> he selected Japanese. Um, and uh, uh, without having the slightest idea what that was all about, and it, but he was a, he was uh, intent enough to find an instructor, a Japanese uh, national in Sydney, and he started to learn Japanese, and he became involved with uh, the program that was run at Duntroon at that stage. Uh, they were also learning Japanese. Um, he he topped the course, and uh, everyone was very impressed by this. He had an almost natural affinity for Japanese. Uh, in those days, to finish your studies, you went off to Japan, which is the appropriate place to learn Japanese, and you spent two years in the country, uh, living in in amongst the population, no no uh, scriptural situation, and he became extremely proficient, not only in your everyday spoken Japanese uh, and in the marketplace, but also in the higher level Japanese, which is used in government communications. Japanese is a language that has these, these uh, variations in the words that are used. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the time he was ex examined, and the people who did the examination were the, the staff of the British Embassy, we had no embassy in those days in Tokyo, who were very impressed by Eric and uh, said so, and sent a report back to the Admiralty. Meanwhile, Eric went back to, to uh, Australia, joined HMS Sydney, or travelled around with the flag officer commanding uh, from cruiser to cruiser. Uh, the Japanese training squadron used to visit Australia every couple of years. He was the interpreter, interpreted uh, for the Japanese Admiral and uh, and uh, even for Admiral Jellicoe, who, who was then the, uh, the uh, Governor General of New Zealand. So this all looked pretty routine stuff until uh, the Australian Navy got a request wondering if, uh, if Lieutenant Eric Nave, Paymaster Lieutenant Eric Nave, could join the British China fleet, uh, which in those days was one of the more powerful fleets. Uh, and uh, they said, yes, this is an honour to, be, to be, uh, have one of their officers selected to join a, a British Admiral staff. When Eric arrived in Shanghai and, and, and boarded the flagship Hawkins, uh, he was shown to a pokey little cabin um, with, no, with no scuttle to look out of and a pile of paper. What the British had been doing is intercepting Japanese messages since uh, 1921, uh, but they hadn't been able to break the code. Eric was supposed to break the code because he's good at Japanese. A tall order. But he was that sort of a bloke. He turned to uh, with a will and with the assistance of some um, very perspicacious comments by his communication staff to the effect that it's funny these signals get sent whenever a Japanese ship moves anywhere. Uh, he was able to use that information to, to take back bearings, if you like, which was at what time did it sail and where did it go to in order to start making breaks into the Japanese code then in force. Not only that, he also fairly extensively mapped the Japanese radio communications networks uh, by tracking the call signs. So by the time he finished his work, in 1925, he'd broken two codes. Uh, he'd also, that was the, the, the operational code and the dockyard code, it was called. And it's on top of that, he had mapped the Japanese uh, communications network and attached all the call signs. So that he, you mentioned, uh, Alice, there, uh, you can find out quite a lot without even breaking a, a message. And that meant that if an admiral based in a particular ship sent a big, long message to a lot of addresses that probably meant there was some sort of operation going on and he was leading it. Uh, then Eric returned to Australia again. Um, and in 1927, another message came from the Admiral saying, could we borrow, could we have the services of uh, Lieutenant Nave RAN in, in the Admiralty? Now, this was an even more special honour because not much happened if you were colonial in, 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 as far as the Admiral, Admiralty was concerned. So... He was uh, again released and sent to the UK where he expected to be employed in the Admiralty, uh, but they walked him straight through Admiralty Arch to a dingy office block, uh, which was called the Government Co Code and Cipher School, uh, 
uh, into a, a dusty office with a rickety desk and a well-known pile of messages, which they hadn't been able to break. And he, again, he was told to get to and solve those codes. So we might leave it there, I'll soon come back to him later. Sounds good, thank you. Peter Jones, another influential figure in this story is, is Rupert Long. Um, what was he like? What was his vision of reinvigorating uh, naval intelligence? Well, Rupert Long, like <laughs> Eric Nave, was born in 1899. He, um, Rupert was part of that famous pioneer class, the first class of midshipmen to join the Royal Australian Navy. So his classmates, of course, included people like John Collins and um, Harold Farncombe, Jack Newman, who we'll touch on as well. Um, and they, to varying extents, play a, a, a part in, in this story. Um, so Rupert uh, had operational service in World War I. Um, after World War I, very early after World War I, he was introduced into the world of naval intelligence by just attending a, a course at Greenwich, which sort of opened his eyes and his interest into naval intelligence. Um, naval intelligence for a career officer wasn't a career specialisation. Um, and so, although he hankered to try and get into naval intelligence, the Navy didn't actually want him to go into naval intelligence, and he had to pick one of the traditional warfare specialisations, and he completed the torpedo officer's course and became a torpedo specialist. Um, and it wasn't until 1934 that he became the district intelligence officer in Sydney. Um, and that position, there was seven district in intelligence officers around the country, but the Sydney one, because that's where the fleet was based, was the most important intelligence position after the um, Navy office then in Melbourne. Um, and um, he found a, an organisation that had been uh, allowed after World War I really to sort of fall into some disrepair. In those days, intelligence officers, naval intelligence officers, were very much involved in the collection of intelligence. And so in his mind, he started to formulate what are the attributes you needed for an invigorated naval intelligence organisation. First one was that these district intelligence officers had to go out and actually organise the collection of intelligence. So he set up uh, a network of contacts, whether they were shipping agents, masters of ships, the local police, um, uh, uh, also um, uh, from the, the warships themselves that, that went round the Australia station. So he started developing this network to actually collect intelligence. So that was one element. The other element was um, when, when he'd done an earlier staff course in UK, um, he'd heard a presentation about the importance of tracking merchant shipping from, from countries, and that sometimes can give you a clue about what their intent is. And so he um, realised that it was important to track, in particular, German and Japanese shipping. Um, and um, he had previously, on holidays, been to Germany um, and seen the sort of rise of, of, of Nazi Germany. So he was seized by you know, the potential danger there with Germany. Um, and on an earlier posting, he'd been in, um, on the China station and he'd also seen the very aggressive stance of Japan in China. So he was aware of the, these two threats looming and so he thought that was important to have a, uh, an ability to actually track their shipping to, and to see any changes in the pattern, you know, as an early indicator that there may be hostilities. Um, the other element that he saw was important was reinvigorating the Coast Watch network and in particular um, expanding that Coast Watch network to New Guinea, the Solomons, that area as an early tripwire for detecting any movement, in particular here, of German and Japanese shipping. Um, and the final element, when he, he moved in 1936 to Navy office um, and to a position as a lieutenant commander as the assistant uh, director of naval intelligence, in those, at that period, the director of naval intelligence was actually um, the assistant chief of naval staff. So that was the, the captain who was, if you like, the deputy to the, the chief of naval staff. And one of his many jobs was being <coughs> the director of naval intelligence, um, which sort of, I guess, indicated where the priority of the naval intelligence fitted. But, um, but essentially, Rupert now um, 
was able to organise uh, and reinvigorate naval intelligence from the centre. Um, and um, the Assistant Chief of Naval Staff at that time was classmate John Collins. And John um, had lots of things going on and he really trusted what Rupert was trying to do. And, uh, and John Collins uh, saw his role was just to support and provide top cover for Rupert as he tried to re reinvigorate naval intelligence. The final piece to the, the puzzle, if you like, at the formulating in, in Rupert Long's mind was that um, uh, uh, Joe Strasick has talked about uh, the Far East Combined Bureau, or FECB, which was, if, if you like, an all-source centre which brought in all different elements of intelligence, one of which was code-breaking and, and analysis of traffic. Um, and Rupert Long saw that it was vital for the, the, the Navy to, to have, once again, this ability to um, track uh, the signal traffic and also break codes. Um, so a submission was put forward to the Menzies government to actually do that. Um, initially, Menzies did not support having an indigenous capability. Um, and uh, Menzies said that the British have that capability. It takes a long time to be able to develop and we should rely on the British capability. Um, Rupert's view, which in the end prevailed, uh, in fact, was if that's the case, uh, if it takes a long time to develop, you need to start now. And, uh, and I think also he, he saw that the, um, having this capability in Hong Kong as it was then was quite an exposed location. And actually, uh, it's, it may become very important to have a capability within Australia. And so, so it's those sort of elements that Rupert you know, tried to put into place and tried to engineer from his position in place to try and get these things into a mature state. Um, and the, the, the final bit was that, um, just like with the FECB, is to have an ability where all those um, elements were brought together and distilled into a, a um, combined intelligence operations centre. And, but that didn't happen until into the war period. But he saw that it was important <coughs> that you try and bring all these elements together and then provide useful intelligence for, uh, for the, the, the military hierarchy to make informed decisions. Joe, by 1939, what elements of this, this were in place? Um, what, was, uh, what could Australia do to break codes um, and analyse the signals and, and then to integrate it into the intelligence activities? Um, I suppose starting, starting from the back part first, we, we never fully developed an ability to analyse the intelligence we, we were, or the information. We were always providing the raw material elsewhere. Um, so, but by 39, the, the um, direction finding stations were starting to come online. You, you had, as I said before, the intercept station um, it had uh, been was being constructed, or was finished, and Nave, uh, uh, then Commander Nave, Royal Navy, who was in Singapore, the FECB had to move from Hong Kong because, as was alluded, it was a very exposed position, mm -hmm. had relocated to Singapore. Um, Eric Nave had to come out of Singapore because of uh, illness, and he was basically told he could never serve in the tropics again. Uh, Commander Long and the uh, um, first naval member who had been the naval attaché in Tokyo at the time when Eric Nave took his final test um, basically agreed to the idea of let's use his um, abilities and we'll establish this uh, you know, cryptographic organisation. Uh, and as Peter alluded, the Prime Minister then, uh, Robert Menzies, wrote to the British uh, seeking their guidance. And the response from the British was, yeah, they weren't, they didn't necessarily like the idea. But they were quite happy for Australia to send people to the UK for training. So, of course, the unwritten part of that statement was, and then we'll put them into our organisations. Um, <coughs> but anyway, they, the Navy went ahead the uh, Chiefs of Staff for the Air Force and the Army eventually agreed to create an organisation. Uh, the Army had 
uh, been utilising some Sydney University professors for code-breaking work in Sydney at the time. Um, Nave went up to Sydney, saw, you know, talked to them. They were all bought, eventually brought down to Melbourne to form what was called the uh, Special Intelligence Bureau. Okay. Um, and so, uh, so you're starting to get this small organisation created. Um, now, in 90, early 1941, uh, Captain Wiley, who was the Chief of Intelligence Staff for the Far East, he basically ran the FECB, he visited Australia and New Zealand on his way back to England uh, to talk about intelligence and cooperation, etc. And he advised the, uh, uh, the Australians that the uh, problem the British were facing was that their intercept stations couldn't pick up the combined fleet trans daytime combined fleet transmissions, nor the daytime uh, Japanese transmissions out of the mandated islands. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, uh, this, they asked the Australians and also the New Zealanders if they could particularly cover the um, mandated islands. The other area that he wanted Australia to look at or to cover was transmissions from the Russian Far East. Um, and no reason was given for that. Um, it may have been, yeah, they were interested in what, if there were signs of massive movements of Russian forces out of the Far East, which could perhaps free the hand of the Japanese to become involved with the war against Russia uh, in the, up in the, um, you know, the Russian Far East. So these, these um, elements were coming to play. The uh, Australians also liaised closely with the New Zealanders, who were at that time also setting up a small uh, organ intercept organisation. And the point also to be made is that when we're talking intercept, we're also talking telegraphs, not mm -hmm. just HF, the, uh, HF interception of wireless. Yep. So you're talking um, yeah, intercepting telegrams from the, from the consulates or the embassies or the diplomatic st stations, giving them to the code breakers and having them look at that. Um, and there was a system set up whereby the New Zealanders would send a code word to Australia if the Japanese uh, diplomatic staff in New Zealand were sending a telegram back to um, Tokyo so the Australians could pick that uh, off, off the wires, as it were. Okay. Um, they also established, uh, with the assistance of the British, a liaison with the Dutch in the Netherlands East Indies. Um, the Dutch had been monitoring and uh, looking at Japanese codes as well. And the method of the trans transmitting um, exchanging the information between the Australians and the Dutch was via an Enigma machine. Um, which, having said that, it's, it's not the same Enigma machines that were the Germans were using. Okay. Um, you know, it's like saying, you and I drive a Holden. You know, mine's a Caprice and yours is a Barina. Um, yeah, that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, that, that, yeah, that was the broad setup um, at the time. The Australians didn't have any connection with the Americans in the Philippines. Um, that exchange was started much later between the British in Singapore and the, and the Americans. Um, but yeah, we'd started our own small organisation. We were starting to send feelers out uh, with exchange and cooperation with you know, um, the Dutch, the New, Ze New Zealanders. Uh, and our infrastructure was starting to grow and we were starting to recruit additional people. Okay. Ian Fennigworth, uh, as Joe's set out, uh, international cooperation is obviously very important to, to efforts like this. Um, and, and the Americans are obviously a very large part of the, uh, the, the picture in the Pacific. Can you just describe um, the situation for them and, and indeed the, the general situation in the Pacific in the lead up to the attack on Pearl Harbor? Yeah, well, a very complicated uh, situation, and, and we we need to understand. You listeners need to understand that at this stage, uh, and in fact for a few more years after this, there was what amounted to open warfare between the United States Army and the United States Navy. There was no United States Air Force then; that belonged to the Army. So the the two services, which had both 
had um, uh, code breaking code breaking organisations during the First World War, when they finally got into it, um, nevertheless had uh, pers persisted after the war, and and, and developed two separate organisations that d did not cooperate. Um, the United States Navy did much the same as, as the British and we did in sending people to Japan uh, to, to assimilate the language and to, under, to understand the country. Um, but their efforts at code breaking were much less successful because they didn't have the background and uh, the most famous case probably was they, they broke a code by uh, literally breaking a safe in the Consul General's office in New York. Uh, that was how the Americans broke codes in those days. But, but that changed. People, people began, began to uh, be able to master the idea of codes. And, and as was mentioned before, um, the American army did in fact manage to break into a Japanese diplomatic code, a lower level code. Uh, and the Japanese diplomatic service did use machine codes, uh, which the Americans again later broke into. It was called purple. And uh, in fact, purple machines were, were, as, were as trade good for the Americans. Uh, meantime, back in Britain, and as Joe has said, you know, they were quite happy to take our people and use them while telling us we didn't have any role in this. Um, the, the, uh, Eric had become very adept at breaking uh, codes, and in fact he broke, he broke several more Japanese codes while he was working both in, um, in the Government Code and Cipher School and, uh, and back in Hong Kong. The Far East Combined Bureau was the first all-source intelligence uh, office in the world um, and when it meant all source it meant all source it was spies it was uh, diplomatic gossip it was army navy air force it was everybody and including Australia uh, the deputy commander of FECB for some time was it was an Australian officer um, and that became about because the Japanese had done something awful they had uh, they had been pressing their case in in China for some time of course and in 1931, they decided they were going to attack the Chinese uh, army outside Shanghai, which they coveted. Um, but they did so by firing over the international settlement, which was where the, the Europeans basically had, had their people and their what they call factories and offices and so forth. Uh, this horrified everybody because, I mean, no one wants to be shelled. And, and it, you know, if it didn't reach the Chinese, it was going to hit, hit the Europeans. And so the British Admiral um, called a conference and said, told the Japanese to stop, which they did. But what the shock was that it all happened without the British knowing anything about it. The first thing they learned was when the first shots were fired. And this caused a major rethink of what the hell they were doing. Why was it they were not able to define or divine what the Japanese were, were about? And so the Far East Combined Bureau was set up um, and operated very successfully. Uh, the picture on the other side of the Pacific, if you like, was not so good. As I said, the American Army and Navy did not cooperate. But there were uh, beginnings of a system similar to the one the British set up uh, in, in, uh, with their uh, high-frequency direction-finding uh, network. Uh, we all also should at this point mention the Canadians uh, who were involved as well. Uh, but by, say, the mid-30s, there was a pretty good system uh, of being able to triangulate emissions from Japanese sources and, and, to, and to plot their positions. Uh, on the code-breaking front, they were making slow progress, uh, but, but the Japanese changed the code, as one does, and they started using a code, called code which they called Code D. Uh, the Americans gave it the name J in Japanese Navy 25, which is how it's become known, but it was Code D for the Japanese. Um, this put everything back to square one because it was a new code with a new code book uh, and a new way of, of super encrypting it. So it had to start from the very they had stuff from the very beginning again. Uh, back in FE, back in uh, London, they it noted that there were some similarities between the new code D and a code that were previously broken. And because Eric Nave had been working with his British uh, uh, counterparts, and he was by now a British officer because he accepted a commission in the Royal Navy in 1930. He was uh, he was part of that action, and in fact, um, while Code D was stumping everybody, they had made a they had made a break in London 
and uh, they sent representatives out to FECB, which was by now in Singapore, um, and uh, Eric was involved in working with them. And you could say practically by, uh, by December 1939, uh, the British had broken uh, Code D. Now, let's be clear on this point. Breaking a code doesn't mean you can read every message encoded in it. It means you have broken into the systems or the systematic treatment of, of coding and decoding, uh, and therefore you can decipher, I'm mixing the terms here, but you can, you can find out information from messages perhaps as much as 10% if you're lucky. It does not mean the British could, could uh, read the codes, which was what was later alleged about Nave uh, in a book called, uh, uh, his name I forget, but I'll remember shortly. Um, the issue then became this. We have two, two countries which will p p potentially, because it was not clear, uh, be allies, the United States and the British Commonwealth. Um, the, the question then became, uh, if, the Briti if the Americans won't commit themselves, as they would not, and nevertheless, we can involve them in negotiations and discussions. And so as early as 1940, we have the Americans sitting in on meetings in Singapore planning what to do if the Japanese invaded uh, the, the British and Dutch uh, territories to the south, and, of course, the Philippines involving the Americans. But they could never at any stage commit... Uh, the Americans could never commit to any plans that were developed because they didn't know that they would be fighting the Japanese. The same thing happened in the uh, in the Sigint area, uh, where the British, of course, were hard-pressed by, by the Germans in Europe, uh, and they decided that they would use their trade goods, which we now know, of course, to be their breaking into the Enigma codes of the Germans, to attract American interest and support. And so a, 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 a group was invited across to the UK, was shown not quite the crown jewels, but certainly a, a great portion of them, uh, to excite their interest in what the British were doing and to, um, to if possible, uh, find a way of cooperating because, of course, many hands make light work. The same decision was made in the Far East where the station of most interest uh, was that in, uh, in Cavite, a naval base in the Philippines near, near Manila, which went by the code name CAST. All the American stations uh, had an initial letter, which, and that was the American phonetic alphabet in those days. The cast was C for Cavite. There was also Hypo in Honolulu, H, of course, and so on. And uh, the, the people in cast were very sceptical uh, that the British had done what they said they had done. This meeting took place in March 1941, and, and the personality of Rudy Fabian, who will come very uh, prominent shortly, uh, played a part in that. Uh, some people uh, in, in post-war history say that um, the Americans scoffed at what the British had. They had nothing that we didn't have. But in fact, the opposite is the case. I mean, they were astounded that the British had made so, many, so much uh, progress in breaking, as I said, piece by piece, into JN25. So cooperation was slowly developing, but it would take the war to, in fact, uh, uh, forge that. Do you want me to carry on with that bit? No, I think that's, that that's, uh, gives us a good um, understanding of, of the situation as it was um, when the Pacific War did start. Um, yeah, I, I hope I've made the, ca the point that um, there was deep suspicion between the, the code-breaking organisations of the United States Navy, open warfare with the code-breaking organisations of the United States Army, and, and not very much support coming the British way from this effort they'd made to try and involve the Americans. No, you've definitely definitely made that that clear. Um, I think the uh, the thing seems to me is that this this organisation um, between different countries um, haltingly is starting to get it all uh, itself together, and then the Pacific War starts and it goes very badly for the for the Allies. The Japanese make rapid progress. Um, uh, the Philippines are lost. <coughs> Singapore is besieged and and. Uh, lost shortly thereafter. Um, this this code breaking capability that's being constructed is in danger of being overrun. Joe, what happened and how did how did, how was it kept? 
Right, um, if, if you could imagine, a, a, say, a map of the Pacific, um, and base I'm talking the, the, the whole east, east to west, the British, when they established the Far East Combined Bureau, it was set up in Hong Kong, and then the intercept station was on Stonecutters Island uh, in Hong Kong Harbour. As uh, Hong Kong became more exposed, it was relocated, the, the cryptographic team, down to um, Singapore. Mm -hmm. Now, the main function of the FECB was to provide a war warning that, that there's a possibility the Japanese going to war. Um, and as, um, as David alluded, uh, sorry, Ian alluded to, the, that was done predominantly by the tracking of Japanese merchant ships, more so than by the code breaking. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> so the, the FECB is now established in Singapore. When the Japanese attack, the British lose the, the station in Hong Kong. The few people that are left in Hong Kong, I think most managed to escape. Those that were captured were never known what they were actually doing, so they weren't interrogated. Um, the FECB eventually is evacuated from Singapore to, to India, where it basically splinters in, into its individual service elements the Navy setting up in uh, Ceylon, modern day Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and eventually moving elements of it across to Mombasa. Mm -hmm. The facilities at Singapore are gone. Um, Penang, which had, I think it was a direction finding station, that's lost. The direction finding stations in Sarawak are gone. Um, and effectively, all that's left for the British uh, are uh, stations in India, Esquimalt on the west coast of Canada. Now, the similar thing with the Americans. Uh, the team at Cavite eventually moves into uh, Bataan, onto the Bataan Peninsula. As the Japanese pressure onto Bataan, they're evacuated by submarine initially to um, Java, and then from Java they get to Australia and make their way to Melbourne. Uh, when they arrive in Melbourne, they're uh, co-located with the uh, Naves at, uh, SIB in the Monterey Flats, um, and I believe the buildings still exist. Mm. Now, they're basically two separate organisations co-located, um, but the Americans have again lost their facilities. Anything, <coughs> anything west of um, Hawaii is gone, so that they're now relying on stations on the west coast of the US uh, for their um, direction finding and in, Hon and in Hawaii for interception. So the stations in Australia become important because if you, if you think about it, you've got two parallel lines of, of um, facilities, the British on the west and the Americans on the east. And the Australian and even the, the New Zealand stations now form a bottom line which creates a U around the Japanese uh, occupied islands and so forth. Um, so that, that provides that uh, critical strategic infrastructure. Um, the people, as I said, uh, they're, they're co-located. The British have moved uh, to India. Uh, a request was made whether they could come to Australia or if we would be capable of supporting them. Commander Newman said we didn't have the facilities to do it. Um, and I think also that even though the British asked the question, I think in the back of their mind was a strategic thought that we're better off relocating uh, in um, Ceylon and, and India because of where the British would be fighting. Uh, because if you remember at this stage also, the command structure for the war in the Pacific had been created with uh, General MacArthur's Southwest Pacific area, the British having the Southeast Asia Command and the US Navy looking after the um, you know, Central Pacific. Okay. So, so that, that overlaid command structure was then overlaid on the intelligence organisations. The difference was that uh, what eventually becomes Frumel is responsive back to, back to Washington, not to General MacArthur. So any of the intelligence that he would eventually get from Frommel would be um, basically hand carried out to him. Um, now, with the um, people, as uh, Ian alluded, um, Rubin Fabian uh, was one of the key Americans, and he seems to be one of these... He was a very... Um, abrasive person, 
um, he, was, he was obsessed with security. Um, yeah, was, you know, he, he didn't trust the Australians and the security of the Australians. Um, he, you know, just basically, if it wasn't US Navy, yeah, it wasn't reliable. Um, and that caused a lot of uh, clash, clashes with um, Eric Nave. And eventually, as a result of what was called the Holden Agreement uh, in late, later in 1942, um, that's when Frumer was formally cast, as it were, under the Americans. Um, and uh, Commander Nave moved up to uh, work with the then uh, newly, newly created also Central Bureau, which was uh, General MacArthur's uh, code-breaking organisation. Okay. Peter Jones, I know you've looked into the creation of Frumel uh, a little bit. Um, is there, uh, can you describe from a, from a Navy perspective um, what were they were trying to achieve um, with this, um, I guess, uh, co-location of people from all sorts of different parts of the world? Yes, so with the fall of the Dutch uh, East Indies, there was a large number of uh, different organisations which were coming back to Australia, predominantly from the, uh, on the west coast. As Joe indicated, um, the, uh, the remnants of cast um, had um, made their way to the, to the west. Uh, Fabian and um, Rosie Mason, um, the two key officers of, of cast, came across to the Navy office, met with um, Rupert Long and uh, Jack Newman, who was the Director of Naval Communications at that point. Um, they were met with open arms and uh, quickly desks were moved and, and so that they could uh, co-locate. Um, and then the, the idea was born to create this combined organisation. Um, and Jack Newman became, would become the deputy of Frommel. Um, Jack was a communicator, so he wasn't, was an intelligence background communicator. He played a key role in the establishment of that new strategic communications network that uh, has previously been talked about, the uh, HMAS Harmon at uh, Canberra, Jandicott, Coonawarra, all those sort of elements. He was one of the chief architects of that. So his perspective really was looking at the infrastructure side of, um, of, of that facility. Um, and uh, the other element, of course, is he was a key figure in the actual creation of the Women's Royal Australian Naval Service mm. um, with um, Mrs Florence McKenzie uh, from the, the Women's Emergency Communications Corps. So this was in 1941, April 1941 it, uh, was uh, when that was formed. Um, so he was a, a, the key communications sort of person, if you like. By disposition, um, a deep communications knowledge, very uh, strict disciplinarian, but he actually got on with people and he, he did get on well with the, the key American players and that was important um, as the deputy of this organisation. Okay. Craig, um, Joe mentioned Central Bureau. What was Central Bureau and how does it fit into the <coughs> picture? And, and, and how is it different from Frumel? Um, well, it's Army Navy, sorry, Army uh, Air Force, mm -hmm. not Navy. Uh, it was a germ of an idea with a couple of the men coming back from the Middle East um, after the war with Japan had started. Uh, and the director of, um, was he, director of Army Intelligence, mm -hmm. um, Caleb uh, Roberts, independently came up with the same idea of setting up a... Um, a code-breaking organisation that was, in their concept, was to be Army, Navy and Air Force. Um, Fabian, who we've mentioned a couple of times, a somewhat abrasive person, as described accurately, uh, chose not to. He wanted to stay separate. And that probably comes out, amongst other things, of the history of Army, US Army and US Navy being at loggerheads traditionally but also as a part of Fabian's personality. So at the same time, MacArthur was getting frustrated with the level of service that he was getting from Fabian and his people. Um, the, the information he got was determined not by him, as he would have thought it should have been, but by uh, Leary, who was the uh, person that uh, 
Fabian worked to locally, uh, or else Admiral, by Admiral Leary, Admiral the Leary commander Kibbert of the South Pacific uh, Fleet. Yep. Area, yep. Yep. Um, so the, when this idea surfaced, uh, MacArthur was keen on it. So they set up initially in a, a mansion in Melbourne in South Yarra. Um, made slow progress. The army codes are much harder to break into than the navy ones, the Japanese ones, um, because the army codes, whereas the Japanese had the one code JN25 that was widely used and therefore widely transmitted uh, on powerful signals, the army ones tended to be different from regiment to regiment, okay. uh, so they were only used more locally, they were lower power transmission, harder to pick up, and because they were used by a smaller group, there was not the large volume of, um, of messages to sift through to try and work out the code. So they hadn't, for a long time, they made very little progress. Lots of enthusiasm, but not much, not much progress. Uh, they followed, uh, when MacArthur moved his headquarters up to Brisbane, they followed them up to Brisbane, uh, still not making much progress while the Navy, the Fremel, was uh, scoring big hits with the uh, lead up to the Battle of Coral Sea and to the Battle of Midway, both of which the uh, intelligence that preceded that were serviced by Fremel as well as the uh, Hawaiian based uh, code breaking unit. Um, they eventually, they, they had the Central Bureau had a good uh, collection of field intercept units mm -hmm. uh, because they had already been doing that, the Army had already been uh, doing that in the Middle East. They, so they came home with Middle East battle experience mm -hmm. and built from that uh, because the, they were attached to Central Bureau and because they were following, if you like, the, uh, the Allied counter-attack counter uh, advance they were getting continuing battlefield experience in New Guinea. Uh, and eventually, a, uh, the Australian soldiers advancing on the north coast of New Guinea uh, picked up a metal case of code books that had been dumped by the retreating Japanese uh, in the usual pouring rain that happened happened there, where they had to cart their guns, their cannons, their, uh, themselves, everything, and supposedly these metal cases of code books up greasy, uh, precipitous pathways through the jungle, <laughs> they decided to ditch the code books by putting them into a deep, uh, into a, a gully in a stream that was rising. Mm -hmm. Because they were metal uh, and they were just checking for mines had been left behind. The Australians coming through picked up the metal case, opened it up, thought in fact it was a mine at first, found it was a box full of books. Didn't work out in initially what it was, but sent them to Brisbane. They knew what they were, and they were the books were army code books. So that was the one of the, the, one of the big jumps that got them into the game. Um, they followed the, the uh, uh, MacArthur's uh, headquarters up eventually to uh, the Philippines, but that's later in the story. So, so uh, similar intent for the organisation, um, yes. but, but different <coughs> means and, and customers for D it. Different organisation, different structure. Um, Central Bureau was modelled on Bletchley Park. Mm -hmm. Um, Fromell wasn't, so my use of it in the title is a bit of artistic licence. It's well, it, it is like Bletchley Park, a code-breaking unit, but that's about where the similarity ends. Uh, Central Bureau was deliberately set up and structured. So they had units in which that were, had both American and Australian people working mm -hmm. uh, cooperatively in a unit in a way that was never the case with Frumel. Uh, it was never the case because, as has been mentioned, Fabian had a intense hatred of the US Navy and of the British. And for him, the Australians were just a low form of British. Not of the Japanese that you can see. Ja Japanese were just a job. Um, <coughs> he, so he also had this obsession <laughs> with security. So 
he was at loggerheads with everyone. He was a good administrator of the, uh, in the head kicker mould. Uh, and the US Navy presumably liked that. He got things done. He went around banging heads and um, telling the Australians what he thought of them. Uh, so people fit it in. But it didn't create a cooperative uh, mould. The Americans that were working with him sort of were a bit more used to him, I suppose, because they were part of his team and he treated them differently. So they're sort of, as recording is saying, he was... Uh, a funny guy to work with, but you sort of got to understand what it was about eventually and worked your way around him. Craig Colley, Joe Streisack, Peter Jones, Ian Fennigworth, thank you for this fantastic account of the lead up to the creation of the Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne, one of the most important Australian Navy operational units during the Second World War. The second episode will cover some of the operations of the unit and the impact they had on the course of the war. In the meantime, Thank you for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. For more great stories about Australia's naval history, just search for the Naval Studies Group in your podcast app.